Hope y'all enjoy having the orchestra up here. These we have the church and the church. Chris did say that, uh, can you turn me down just a little bit? Thank you. Um, I don't know if I can hear myself like that. Y'all are probably going. Um, Chris did say today that uh, they're going to take a little break, but they will be back at some point. So this is not the last time you've seen the orchestra up here playing. Uh, you're going to get to see them some more. And I hope y'all are uh, ready for Christmas because, as Pete Carroll uh, said a few years back before one of their first preseason games, he said, it's the day before the day before. Now, you know, the people on his, uh, on his team were thinking, this is crazy. This is a preseason game. He relax a little bit. Well, you know, it is the day before the day before. And uh, it is a great time. I am hoping that, that you are ready for Christmas. I was looking at our Christmas tree just yesterday, and my wife, I kind of laughed, and I looked at our Christmas tree, and there was only like one present. Now, fortunately, that was a present that I bought for her, which fulfilled my Christmas shopping duties. <laughs> yes, I am very blessed. Uh, my wife takes care of Christmas. I get hers, and then I find out when I got the kids on Christmas Day. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, there was only one present, and, and I was like, oh my goodness, Denise is going to be going crazy. And we were like, no, because... Uh, my son already got his Christmas ring, he got his class ring, and my daughter, um, her Christmas is coming in July. <laughs> you know, we're spending, we're going to be spending a lot of money, and I said, congratulations, that's all you get this year. So uh, Christmas shopping was a little easier uh, for us to do, well, it was just the same for me, but it was easier for my wife this year. Um, you know, we're going to, we sing a song, and I, I said last night on Facebook that Probably one of my favorite Christmas songs. I thought that this was a really new song until I went back and studied it and, you know, okay, I Googled backstory behind what child is this. You know, it is so much easier to find out information now uh, than it used to be. You know, it used to you had to buy books and go through books and try to find. Man, now you just go to Google. And, and what Google told me about that story was really kind of cool because this story uh, the story behind what child is this? It is a. It was written by a man named William Chatterton Dix. Uh, he was born in 1837 in Bristol, England. So that says to you, this story, this song is kind of old. Uh, he was born in Bristol. As a young man, he moved to Glasgow, Glasgow, Scotland, uh, where he pursued a career managing a marine insurance company. But his passion was poetry. He loved. Poetry, he loved to write poetry, to read poetry. Well, then at some point, Dix became seriously ill. And he was confined to his bed for an extended period of time. And it was during this time where he was confined to his bed that he underwent a true spiritual crisis. You know, he was a man that we would probably call a nominal Christian. He was a guy that, that would go to church pretty often. Uh, would, he would attend church, but... But Christ wasn't truly real in his life. You know, Jesus was just kind of something that you did on Sundays when you went to church and, and you sang the songs and the guy got up and preached and then you went home. And, but so Christmas, or Christ was just kind of what you did on Sundays. It wasn't really, Jesus wasn't really a, a factor in his life. But during this, this physical crisis that he had, he spent a lot of time in prayer. Sometimes, you know, when you're laying in bed and that's about all you can do, you turn and you turn to Jesus. And he did. He turned to Christ and he began to spend a lot of time in prayer. He began to read his Bible more. He was reading other Christian literature. And, and through this experience, God just really got a hold of him. And, and the story says that after this time, that most of Dix's poetry began to focus on Christian things. Before, he had done all kinds of other stuff, but now his, God had his heart so much that, that his poetry, what he loved to write, really started focusing on Christian themes. And one of the songs, one of the poems that he wrote was called The Manger Song. And this song of the a Child is This was derived out of that poem, The Manger Song. It was per, first published in 1865 in Britain and became popular quickly in the United States as well. I love this song because it begins in the manger with the child sleeping on Mary's lap, accompanied by angels and shepherds. But the second verse asks this great question. 
why would he be lying in such mean a state? It goes on to speak of Jesus' purpose to plead for the salvation of sinners and alludes to the nails and the cross that he will face as a man. Then the third verse moves to a joyful tune, asking us to bring in Jesus' incense, gold, and myrrh. Why do we do this? What child is this? Because this child is the King of Kings that has come to bring us salvation. And because of that, we should respond joyfully in his honor. When Dix died, he was buried in the church cemetery in Somerset, England. So we have a song. Born out of a time of spiritual crisis. It was brought on by a serious illness. And I think Dix captures the wonder of Jesus' birth and his life in this great song. Well, today we're going to read a variety of scriptures helping us to answer the question, what child is this? You know, I told you this series kind of came out of, of me asking Chris, hey, do you have some songs that you're going to emphasize? And, and he sent back a list to me. And, and at first, he just sent me a list of songs. And what child was this was the first song on there. Um, I didn't realize until after I had written all the sermons that what child was this was going to be the very last of them. Uh, so I had to kind of go back and reorder them a little bit. But as I started thinking about this song, what child is this? I really started asking myself, you know, okay, so what is the, what's the answer? What's the answer to that question? What child is this? And as I started thinking about it, I, I realized that, number one, it is the beginning of the gospel story. But it's not really the beginning of the gospel story. You see, most people think that, that the story of Jesus begins with Matthew. John tells us, honestly, that the story of Jesus begins in eternity. But I want to read to you out of Genesis chapter 3. The first time that Jesus is mentioned. In Genesis 3 it says this, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her. He will crush your head, and you will will strike his heel. And you may say, okay, Grant, I don't understand. How do you say this is the beginning of the gospel story? Well, this is, this is a, a passage that is in the story of the fall of mankind. A, a story that, that would seem like the end of hope. You know, Adam and Eve, it started out and had everything. Everything was perfect for them. Their life was perfect. They were in paradise. When we talk about the Garden of Eden, that, that's really the word for it. It is paradise. They're in the, the best place. They, they have the, op, the ability and opportunity to, to converse with God and, and basically to hang out with God. You read on there, it says that, that God would walk in the garden in the cool of the evening. Can you imagine the incredible privilege that it was to know that, that God was going to come and He's going to walk in the garden and that you're going to be able to just sit and, and hang out with God? And talk with them. They had everything. They had all the food that they needed. But then Adam and Eve sinned. They took the fruit from the one tree that God said, Do not eat from this tree. And they ate from that tree. And in the eating from that tree, they brought sin upon mankind. And in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, is part of the passage that talks about the judgment of God upon Adam, upon Eve, and upon the serpent. And this verse that we read, I will put enmity between you and the woman. He's talking to the serpent. And he says that, that between your offspring and hers, and he says, he. Now who's the he he's talking about? God is talking about the offspring of the woman. This special offspring that would be coming. And that he that is mentioned <coughs> is Jesus. That Jesus will crush the head of the serpent. And he will strike his heel. In the midst of the story of tragedy and the fall of mankind, we see the flourishing of hope. You know, wherever you are today, recognize that, that Christmas is about hope. Christmas is about the, the joy that God brings into our life, the birth of Jesus. Without Jesus, you and I have nothing to look forward to. Without Jesus, there is, there is no hope for all of humanity. But in Jesus, there is hope. And that, that is the essence of the wonder of Jesus. 
hope in the midst of despair. No matter how much life may have beaten you down, you can have hope because Jesus was born. We answer the question, what child is this? We say at the beginning of the gospel, it's the hope of mankind. But we also would say that he's the son of David. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 11. David is, has talked to Nathan the prophet. And he says to Nathan, I want to build a temple for God. And at first, Nathan says to him, go for it, man. That is a great idea. Well, then Nathan goes back and he spends a little bit of time with God. And God the Father says, hold on. David's not the guy. And he replies back, he gives a message back through Nathan. And, and he says to David, as part of this message, he's talking to him, and I'm going to pick it up in the middle of a sentence. And have done, ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel, I will give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that he, that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. David is praying... <coughs> David is saying, man, God, I, I want to build a temple for you. I want to do something great for you. You know, all the other deities around the world, they, they've got magnificent places to worship you. But, but God, you are the only real God. And, and all we have to worship you is this tent. Now, it's a really cool tent. It's a really special tent. And, and we've got the Ark of the Covenant, and, and those are neat things, but... But God, you are like extra special. I want to do something extra special. I want to build a place for you. God replies back and says, David, thank you. David, I appreciate that. But you're not the man to build this temple for me. Why are you not the one to build the temple? Because you have been a man of warfare. You have blood on your hands. David, you've had to do work for me and for my, for my nation. That is unpleasant. And you're not the guy to build the temple. And the story could end right there. If it ended right there, David would be disappointed because he wanted to do this great thing for God. But God doesn't end the story right there. He says, I will build you a great house. And he goes on in there and he talks about that there will be a king that will rule forever. <coughs> that will be from you. And so when Jesus is called the Son of David, it is saying that He, Jesus, is the one who is the fulfillment of that prophecy. The King who will reign forever. God gives a great promise to David. Man, that, that is such a beautiful promise to David when he says, I will build a house for you, a name for you, your son, one of your descendants, will rule forever. Folks, Jesus, what child is this? This is the beginning of the gospel, the hope of the world. But he's also the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. That great promise God gave to David, that one of his descendants would reign forever. David rose from obscurity to become the king of Israel. But the reality is this, that Jesus rose from an obscure birth in a barn to become the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That is what we celebrate at Christmas. But there is one final great truth. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. I read this verse and I've already preached on this verse a few weeks back. Micah says, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. And then Isaiah chapter 9. And I'm going to speak a little bit more about this tomorrow night in our Christmas Eve service. Isaiah chapter 9, starting in verse 1. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future... He will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. 
The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And on those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when they're hiding the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fired, be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. <coughs> Micah 5 2. O Bethlehem, Ephraim, out of you, you, though you are too small to be even among the clans of Judah. We talked about what that meant that, that they couldn't even send, I believe, a thousand soldiers out to the army to fight. But even though you are told too small, even though you're nothing, out of you will come my son, the great ruler of the people of Israel. And then this uh, passage in Isaiah chapter 9, I love how it starts. The land of, of Zebulun and Naphtali, the land of the, the Gentiles, land of darkness. During the days of Jesus was born, the land of Zebulun and Naphtali is Galilee. It was a spiritually dark place. The Romans had conquered all of Judea, all of Galilee. And the people, the Jewish people lived under the thumb of the Romans. There was no hope. Everything seemed dark. There was just this, this feeling of everybody in the, in the area that, that there's nothing to live for. What hope do we have? Well, we can't even fill, uh, we can't even fill the government. All we do is, is harvest our crops, make our products, and, and we go sell our crops, we go sell our products, and, and then what do we have to do? We have to turn around and take almost all of that money and give it to the Romans. And what do the Romans do? Do the Romans come in and, and rebuild our cities and, and provide services for the poor and the needy in our community? No. The Romans take the tax income and they ship it back to Rome. There, there's no hope. What do we have to look forward to? There's no way we can get an army and defeat the Romans. And the Romans also brought in their own religion. And they've set their religion up against the religion of the God of Israel. <coughs> and so the people recognize that I can't even go and, and worship as I really want to. Yes, we still have the temple, but I, I can't really worship God because the Romans are always there. The spiritual darkness. It was despair. No hope. But Jesus brought a great light. Jesus brought light to the world. He's the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father. He is the one that brought hope and light into a great darkness. He wants to bring that light to you, that hope to you. No matter where you are in life, no matter what challenges you face, God has brought hope. He gives you the opportunity to know life, to know joy, to know peace. You might be right now in a time of, of spiritual darkness. You know, for some people, the holidays are almost the hardest time of the year. For those that have lost loved ones, especially if you lost a loved one during the holiday season, those holidays are tough. It doesn't seem, it seems like all the world is, is celebrating and happy and, 
you turn on the TV and you know you watch the Hallmark Christmas movies and, and it's all about homecomings and reunions and, and everything just looks great and happy and, and you look around and you go, no, I'm still miserable. But Jesus came to give us light. Light in the midst of darkness. Light in the midst of despair. Whatever it is that is burdening you and holding you down right now, turn it over to God. Let Jesus have it. And let Him shine His light. Because as He shines His light into your life, yes, there will always be some of that sorrow. If you've lost a loved one, the sorrow is going to be there. There is a sadness. But we hold on to that light. And that light begins to overpower the sadness. And we know that, that our loved ones who are followers of Jesus, we know where they have gone. And we allow that light and that hope to give us hope. So that we can get up on Christmas morning and we can celebrate. We can celebrate the birth of Jesus. We can celebrate that light has come into the world. No matter what may be going on around us. So if you ask me the question, what child is this? I will give you this answer. What child is this? He is the King of Kings. Jesus is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And Philippians 2.11 says, there's going to come a day that in the name of Jesus, Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that He is the King, that He is the Lord. As you celebrate Christmas this year, I encourage you, take some time to celebrate the light that is coming to the world. To celebrate the hope that you and I have as followers of Jesus. God loves us enough he sent his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Hold on to that great hope. And if you are in despair, if sadness is, is overtaking you, turn it to Jesus. Let him have it. Let him shine his light. And he'll remove the darkness in your life. Rejoice in the salvation that he brings. Allow the wonder of this man, whose birth we celebrate, to raise you from spiritual darkness and into the light. Because if you do, the truth is, you will never be the same. God will change you. Even if you are one who has been a believer for many, many years, now there's most of you sitting in this room right now, you have been followers of Jesus, as some of you, for multiple decades. And, and you may get to the point where you start to think, man, you know, I've read the Christmas story so many times that, that I could probably just recite it without even having to look it up in the Scripture. I've been through so many Christmases where we sit down and we all gather around in a circle and, and we read the story of Jesus' birth out of Luke or out of Matthew and, and, and we tell the Christmas story. And then we get on to the really important stuff, right? The opening presents. And I want to challenge you this year. Make the really important stuff not opening the presents. But make the really important stuff telling the Christmas story and the celebration of Jesus. Celebrate him. Celebrate what he's done in your life. And he will change you. Christmas might be a time of gloom for you, but God can make it a time of celebration. Let's pray together. Our Father, I thank you for the opportunity that we have to worship you. And Father, I pray that as we prepare our hearts for Christmas Day, as we prepare our hearts for giving gifts to our loved ones, but Father, I pray that, that we would take that time to make sure that as we do those things,
that we spend the time to worship you and to celebrate what you did through Jesus. Our Father, help us to truly celebrate Christmas this year. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen.